Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, our conversation focused on how each of our three business owners is contemplating emerging from the crisis. In fact, we taped the conversation on Friday morning, May 1st, as Jay Goltz was reopening his home and garden store in Chicago. We talked about the precautions, the risks, the dilemma of asking employees to accept less in pay than they were getting in unemployment, and the threat of a second coronavirus wave that could bring a second shutdown. Jay, who took a break from the taping to see whether any customers were actually showing up at his reopened store, told us, I don't have the luxury of just saying, oh, I'll tell you what, maybe we'll open in six weeks, eight weeks. I mean, there's some point where I'll be out of business. This week's 21 Hats podcast lineup included Jay Goltz, whose businesses in Chicago include a picture frame shop, artist frame service, and the home furnishing store, Jason Home, Dana White, founder and CEO of Paralee Boyd, a chain of hair salons based in Detroit, and Laura Zander, co-founder and CEO of Jimmy Bean's Wool, a digital version of a neighborhood yarn shop that is based in Reno, Nevada. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will, if nothing else, let owners know they are not alone in facing these extraordinary challenges. If you know a friend who might benefit from this conversation, please share it. You can subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you do, please review us and rate us. It makes a big difference. If you have questions or suggestions, you can always email them to me. My email address is lfeldman at 21hats.com. Before we get started, I'm here with Adam Witte, who is the founder and CEO of Advantage Forbes Books, which helps entrepreneurs write and publish their own books. Adam, I know you think all entrepreneurs should consider writing a book. Why is that? A book is the most powerful marketing tool in the world. It's a way for you to share your story and your company's story without anyone ever feeling like they are being sold to. It builds authority, it builds credibility, it builds expertise for you and your business. And we're recording this in the middle of this unprecedented crisis. Is now a good time to write a book? Uh, Believe it or not, Lauren, I would argue now is a better time probably than ever before. Entrepreneurs and business owners have an unprecedented amount of time on their calendar that quite frankly, they did not think that they would have. We are working with entrepreneurs all over the world who are using this unexpected downtime to create an asset for their business that will pay dividends for the rest of their career. If someone does write a book, how will they know if it's effective as a marketing tool? They use a book as a sleuth marketing tool to generate new customers, uh, to advertise their business, and ultimately to help convert uh, prospects into customers. And for many entrepreneurs, a, a customer can be worth hundreds, thousands, even tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so one new customer into your business can more than pay for the book. Uh, Speaking opportunities, PR and media opportunities, those are some of the other benefits. I know a lot of entrepreneurs who've wanted to write a book and have never quite gotten around to it. How do you help somebody in that situation? We do our best to make it as easy and painless as possible. And we do that by first pairing you with a master book planner who spends some time interviewing you and those interviews turn into a blueprint for your book. Then we assign a ghostwriter to work with you to ask you questions about that master book plan, to interview you. It's all done over the phone, Lauren, so it's super easy. Those interviews are then ultimately turned by the ghostwriter into the manuscript of your book. If someone wants to learn more, where should they go? We have a free copy of my best-selling book titled Book the Business and we're offering a discovery consultation to any 21 Hats subscriber that wants to learn more, advantagefamily.com forward slash 21 Hats. You heard him. Go to advantagefamily.com forward slash 21 Hats to get Adam's book and to sign up for your consultation. Now, back to the show. As usual, let's start with uh, quick updates. Dana, uh, what's the status of Paralee Boyd? What's going on with you? Paralee Boyd has received her, the PPP. Whoa. Yeah, I know. Yeah, kind of major. Um, it was not through my bank. It was through uh, Goldman Sachs. Interesting. Um, yep. You got it through Goldman Sachs because you participated in the Goldman Sachs. 10,000 small businesses. Yep. Ah. So they sent an email out to us a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, listen, you guys, we actually have partnered with someone who can move this along, you know, quite well. So the difference with the Goldman Sachs money is they looked at all of 2019, whereas in my bank 
and another entity they looked at from April 2019 to April 2020. So the Goldman Sachs money is uh, like less by like six thousand dollars. And so I also applied through Bluevine and my application was accepted through Bluevine as well. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not familiar with that. Gluevine? What is that? So Bluevine is a lender similar to Lendio. A girlfriend of mine said, Dana, Bluevine is like uh, approving and getting PPP funds out right away. And their application process was very simple. Um, their responsiveness was amazing. Um, and so I went ahead and applied through them too. I was torn about applying through multiple places, but I was just looking at the level of contact from my bank. Why were you torn? Because people were like, you know, you, uh, you should apply once and wait. Well, my <sighs> bank kept saying, you know, we need you to sign the document. We need you to sign the document. So I would fill out the document, sign it per as per their instructions. And then I get another email. You need to sign the document. And I said, I can't keep signing this document. And my just application just wasn't moving. So I took the reins of my own hands and applied through the Goldman Sachs program. I also applied through Bluevine. Anybody else? Nope, just those three. Um, Bluevine has said, you've been approved. We're just waiting on your loan number. And Goldman Sachs has a loan number and an amount. So, and what happened with PNC? Have they gotten back to you? I wish we could put a cricket sound effect right here. Uh, <laughs> cricket, <laughs> cricket, I, I, cricket. I've said cricket. this before. I need to say it again. The big banks just don't need little accounts, period. They've well, got Chase just sent out an email to tons of small businesses that I know today that they all got their money. Well, three yeah. weeks, two weeks later, a week later, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying. I Yeah. They sent it out 3 a.m. this morning and then just on my Goldman Sachs web feed – on my news feed on Facebook, everybody's like, oh, I got awarded, I got awarded, I got awarded. So, but the anxiety and the nerves that everybody was going through, not knowing what to do, right? Should I apply or whatever? So, one thing I, I would add, I, all the advice I've heard is there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's a lot good about applying in multiple places. The only thing you can't do is you can't take the loan, more than one loan. Um, that, that would be a problem. Uh, but you definitely did the right thing by uh, applying in multiple places. I hadn't heard that. I had, I had heard apply one place and sit tight. Even the Goldman Sachs loan said, do not apply if you've applied already. And I ignored it, as did uh, several other people good for you. in our Goldman Sachs class, and they were approved within 24 hours. It was the Goldman Sachs people that actually picked up the phone and called me and asked questions. So the entrepreneur lesson from this is you can't always follow the rules, and that is the reality. You were, you were doing the right thing, listening to all the quote unquote professionals. You were doing what you were supposed to do with your big bank and they didn't come through for you. So you took, you used the phrase, you took it into your own hands and you got the job done. I think Boom. the other lesson that I'm hearing is join these, apply and try to become part of these programs. You know, the Ernst & Young program, the Goldman mm -hmm. Sachs program, mm -hmm. you know, if there's a local program, cause that becomes your quote unquote networking, mm -hmm. um, and that's their goal. That's what think, I'm hearing. Yeah, those organizations are invaluable. Like I wouldn't have had it had I not been an alum. And the other thing is, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurship, don't ask. When you're asking, you're waiting, right? Because you're waiting on somebody to decide to help you or not. I chose not to ask PNC and wait for PNC to decide that they were going to get to my application. Well, you know the phrase, better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. That's another example of it. <laughs> so do you know, Dana, is there any reason to think the loans will be different and that you have a material choice to make here? Or do you think it's it doesn't really matter which one you pick? I think it matters in just an amount of funding. Like I said, with the Goldman Sachs loan, they did January of 19 to January 2020. So that means it's going to be, you know, it's a like $39,000 loan. Whereas the Blue Vine loan is April to April, which is going to be a bigger loan. So I may go with the Blue Vine. Um, and I don't know if this is legal or not, but the governor of Michigan just extended the stay at home order to May 28th. So if I get closing docs next week, Dana may not be signing closing docs next week. I know a lot of small business owners that I'm talking to are rescheduling their closings. So you're saying you might not take the loan? I mean, I, I'll take it. I just may not schedule my closing. No, until. she's delaying it because she's going to be closed, which is smart. Better to add a week at the back end when you're open than get it now when you're closed. Again, <laughs> smart. 
You have to spend it within eight weeks. So if I went to get my closing documents, let's say, you know, Monday the 4th, then their, their process and the bet money hits my account Monday, you know, Tuesday the 5th, well, then the clock starts starting Tuesday. I have eight weeks from Tuesday the 5th to, to use it. Well, I'm saying, no, when is, you know, hey, let's schedule that closing for as far out as I can go and then go from there. Do you have any reason to believe that they'll accommodate you? Will, will they let you wait as long as you want to wait? I mean, they don't, I mean, scheduling a closing, it's, it's, it's your schedule. If I'm unavailable. <laughs> Nobody's unavailable. Right? <laughs> it's like, no, but if I'm, uh, I could be caring for a sick loved one. I could be, I could walk in my dog. Have you thought about how you're going to start spending it and when you're going to start spending it? And you close on the loan, but your shop is still closed. Are you going to pay people before your shop reopens? Probably two people to get us reopened. Right. And so I've already done the setup work so that when I do bring them back, I can just give them their marching orders and pay them not to help me get set up. But here are your marching orders and go and pay them. Um, and then when she does give the green light to open, I will pay my put all my staff based on who we have, put all my staff back on. Um, and then if there's anybody who has any questions, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling comfortable. OK, then. I have to let you go because I'm not in Michigan. They are very clear. You will go to jail if you have a job and you tell somebody, no, you can stay at home and stay on unemployment. No, I'm not doing wow. that. And then they come back and then we'll have a training. We'll have some cultural engagement, some, you know, rah-rah meetings. I'll give everybody their, their face mask, to, you know, train them on how we're going to keep ourselves safe, how we're going to be different. Again, do more training to get their skills honed, and then we will have an opening date, and then we will open on that date. But it may not be the day that she says we can open. I'm not opening up gangbusters. No, I'm not doing that. Jay, you uh, have told us previously that you got uh, a PPP loan. Uh, you're in a similar position in that your business has been closed, but but yours, your, your state is handling it differently. You're... Uh, and in Illinois, you're able to start opening, I believe, today. Is that correct? No, 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 no. It was pushed till the end of the month. But I sell plants at my home store. I have a whole big lot next to my store that in the summer we sell plants. I mean, like, you know, like three, four thousand feet. We have a big lot out there. So because I sell plants, I'm called a plant store and I service some landscapers. Therefore, I am allowed to open that store. Wait, the whole store or just the lot with the plants? You know, you go to Home Depot because they sell some building supplies. They're open. No stores are part open. So if you sell something that somebody needs, the whole store is open. So I have I am confident it's okay for us to carefully open the store and control how many people are in there and mask and the whole thing. So do you, do you have predictions on or projections on how busy it's going to be? I mean, I went, you know, um, drove by Lowe's, like the parking lot is completely full. Well, Constantly. that's funny you ask because I'm an hour behind you know, Lauren. It's 1125 here. I've been open for an hour and 25 minutes. And before we're done here, I will find out whether anyone showed up or not. But from what I heard, we were getting lots of emails that people were anxious to, to, for us yep. to reopen. So, so there I'm good. My wholesale business selling frames, I sell frames to a thousand frame shops around the country. I believe that falls under the category of distribution and quote unquote managing my inventory. Now, most of the stores are still closed, so I'm not doing anything there yet. And my retail picture frame store, uh, there's no way I can open that. There's no, there's just, there's no wiggle room there whatsoever. So my framing business is closed. My home store is open for, for all of an hour and a half now. And you opened t today, the whole, the whole store today and not just the plants. An hour and a half ago. And I don't know, frankly, I didn't go outside yet to see if I, I'm going to, I'll, I'll leave this thing for 60 seconds and tell you whether there's any business here. So we, we made up signage. We made it very clear. Everybody's wearing masks, customers, employees are wearing masks. We're putting tables in front of the checkout so they can't get too close. We're, we're cleaning the place. We're watching how many people are in there. And then there was one other directive I gave to everybody, which is we're suspending the cardinal rule of this company for 42 years. The customer is not always right. 
We will, I've, they all know when they start here, don't go fighting with customers. We will fight with a customer. They want to come in and be a jerk and say, I'm not wearing a mask. We're going to tell them they got to leave. And like, that's the way it is. I'm not, I'm not going to get intimidated by a, a customer who thinks it's okay to come in without a mask. Um, they, and, and that's a huge, that's a huge change for my employees. And I wanted to make sure they know I'll back you up. Um, they're not going to come in here and throw their weight around and go, I'm not wearing a mask. This is overreacted. That's fine. Go somewhere else. Um, I got no use for that. Are you limiting the number of people who can come in at any one time? Yes. We're starting with eight. You know, the store is about seven, 8,000 feet. We think that we're going to start with eight people, but my How did you come up with that number? I you know, the size of the store and we figured out what we could handle. We're only keeping one door open instead of two. I got to tell you, my employees are not thrilled to be at work. Um, they would have just soon stayed home. Is that because they're concerned about their safety or because they were collecting the uh, unemployment with the extra $600 a week? That falls under the category of who knows. I do think, though, that they sincerely are worried about it. And all we can do is everybody's wearing masks, staying away. But like, I just can't. I don't have the luxury of just saying, hey, I'll tell you what. Um, well, maybe we'll open six weeks, eight weeks. I mean, there's some point where I'll be out of business. I, I you know, and it, whatever the day is that, that any business opens in this country, there is still going to be some risk out there. So it's a question of, you know, when's the time to jump in? And we're being extremely careful with how we do it and extremely respectful to the employees that, you know, they don't have to, to, to get near the customers. But I, I, I are you paying you know, them hazard pay? I'm thinking about it. I haven't done anything yet because unlike Michigan, apparently, that made it crystal clear people about the unemployment, I'm still grappling with should the people that are home, should we put everyone back on the payroll and bring them back or leave them on unemployment? The whole thing is just a big murky mess. And, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing, quote unquote, but it's not clear what the right thing is. And we're trying to be. And then the question is going to become this is just this is just scene two of a 10 scene play. The next question is, and what about the employee who doesn't want to come back in two weeks, three weeks? Where do you finally say, sorry, but I've got to replace your job? And then are they going to be eligible for unemployment if you've offered them the job back and they didn't come? I, you know, I don't know. And, They're not. Well, no, you're in Michigan. Yeah. Maybe okay. in Michigan. I got to tell you, you who knows? I, who knows? Uh, I'm not sure which way it's going. How comfortable are you with the idea of, of opening your store now? I mean, most medical experts, they, they would prefer that, you know, we're not opening back up the way we are. Customers are wearing masks. We're wearing masks. We're putting ta- no one's going to get anywhere near six feet. We're cleaning everything. I would say this. All of the experts get a paycheck every single Friday, I'll guarantee you. But Jay, it's not as simple as that. There's a point in time where it's it's just, I'm not going to do anything that's perilous to anybody, but I think we're being extremely careful. Are you worried about potential liability? Suppose one of your employees gets sick. Um, this is becoming a regular theme with the, the show. If I was to worry about everything that I could worry about, I'll be in a mental institution somewhere. So I'm not going to say worry. It's like we're taking all the precautions we can take. And um, I think it'll be okay. If I didn't think it would be okay, I wouldn't be doing it. So is it possible that someone's going to get sick and then blame it on that they came into work? I'm following the law. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Um, it's it's a difficult situation. I Is anybody doing waivers like liability release when you come in the store? Like the government is trying to risk? if you'll if you've been the government's trying to make it illegal to sue a company. If somebody gets sick, they can sue their employer. There there won't be any companies left. Well, you didn't ask this question, which is a good, fair question. Jay, has anybody been sick? No. I don't have one sick employee that I know of. So, it, you know, I'm I think we've been quarantined nicely. I I think we're being prudent. I think we're being careful. I had plants ordered for 6 months. These plants are showing up here. I've got, you know, a lot of money invested in plants. I've got customers who are clamoring to come in to get their plants. I'm Gardening so is huge. If you've yeah. read any other retail numbers, like it's just going yeah. through the roof. Right. So there's people that want the stuff. They're being careful. We're being careful. I mean, at what point do I just, I mean. I think you're doing a great job. I mean. Thank I think, you. Yeah. Well, I people, I've been in your shop. That's, it's reasonable. Yep. 
It's not overboard. I mean, it's yeah. not going to look like Walmart looks. No. You Absolutely. know, it's not going to look. I mean, again, I go by Lowe's and it is. Un, I've never seen the parking lot so full. It's mm-hmm. more full than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. So yeah. to have, you know, a private store that already has a kind of a niche audience be open mm-hmm. with eight people at a time. I just don't see an issue with it. I mean, people are running business. We're running a business and we have more than eight people at our location. So, and they're humans. So what's the difference between, it, and well, they're there by choice. Okay. So let, let me see if I can annoy all three of you. You already <laughs> have Laura done. I, I know I got you, Jay. <laughs> the, the, the big picture here though is i think this by opening back up now when the experts are saying it's too soon they're saying we are running the risk of triggering a second wave and i think the worst thing for all of us for the country and for your businesses too would be for us to have wasted this time that we spent shut down and and to have to do it again. And that's what I really worry about. Do, do you not worry about that, Jay? You left a piece of the puzzle out. Some of these people, I saw in the paper this morning in the Wall Street Journal, Michigan, a bunch of people showed up at the Capitol with guns mm-hmm. saying we want to be open and they don't have mm-hmm. masks on. What is the piece I left out? I'm talking about Customers all have masks. We have masks. They're not getting anywhere near each other, more than six feet apart. We're following all of these things to keep everyone away from each other. It's not like I'm I'm minimizing the problem and going, oh, it's been overblown. We don't need to wear masks. We're not letting anybody in without a mask. We're going to send them away. So I think if you take all of these precautions – I I believe it will be okay. Um, I'm not one of these people that are. You see these people with their protests. They're out there in crowd with no masks. I think that's crazy. So that's not what we're doing. You know, we're taking all the precautions. I agree. I think that calling every day. Yeah, you're being responsible. People are yeah. far apart. It's not. You're not opening a movie theater. No. Well, I don't know. I'm getting ready for the second wave. I'm here in Michigan. I'm looking at people. I'm getting ready for the second wave. That's what I'm doing. And you're saying that because you see people who are not being responsible? Absolutely. And and we don't have enough tests. If you're watching what's happening in the, in, in the homeland, in, in Iowa, in Nebraska, and the people have not been hit hard enough yet, not enough people for them have died for them to take this seriously enough to shut it down. So, okay, you guys go ahead and play with this. I am not. I'm getting ready for fall 2020 when we will most likely have to shut down again because Cletus and Bubba and Jethro and them <laughs> want to go and 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 hang out in the backyard, you know, because the governor said, I can't I can't I can't hang out with my friends. They're mad. So you be mad and be sick while Dana is getting ready to have a much more distance online interaction with her customers getting ready for what's going to happen in the fall. And maybe since I'm not opening till May 28th, that might be something I can do, you know, in the time it takes time to put products and kits together, but I'm getting ready for the second wave right now. And then if we can open, that'd be great. We'll, you know, open, generate revenue, use the PPP, have some cushion, but when, and if we have to shut down again, I will be ready. That's what I'm getting ready. I'm not in a vacuum. Like Home Depot's open. There's hundreds of, People there, yeah. Lowe's is open. Everybody's doing business. I should decide. Oh no, I'm going to take it to a newer level, and I'm not, I'm going to let tens of thousands of dollars of plants die, and I'm just going to shut it down because, um, and then the customers. I'm not. The customers are calling us. They want to come in and buy their stuff. There is a point to where the customers want to come in. We want to sell them things. We're all protecting. We're all wearing all this right stuff. There is a point to where you got to make a value judgment. And um, I don't know that I can go another month without doing any business. I mean, Are I really you gonna- don't. Wait, 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 wait. Why do you say that, Jay? Because I have been shut down. It will be 10 weeks of next to no business coming to in. I don't have I don't have three million dollars sitting in a bank account somewhere. I've had no business coming in. You did get a PPP loan. Does that make a difference? Well, that's I, I pay the people though. with yeah. it. I use it for payroll. Yeah. It doesn't change the fact that, that- Well, you can 25% of it you can use for, for other things, including rent, right? Utilities and rent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'll get, yeah, except, except 
this isn't going to be a light switch going back on. We're going to, I am sure I'm going to lose a ton of money this year. So as soon as we're, the lift is over, it's not like business back to usual. I mean, I've still got the same overheads. I still got the employees. It wouldn't be surprising if my business is off by 30, 40% the day so- we open. Jay, I have a question. Can you do pickup framing and delivery framing? Can you do um, delivery of furniture? um, Yes, we already have a web, jasonhome.com with a Y, Mm -hmm. Jason Home. We, 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 We absolutely stuff stuff on the internet and people can pick out furniture and we can deliver it. Framing, we're hanging plastic shields over the sales counters and people are protected there. If they want to just digitally send in photographs, we can certainly frame those. Wait, you, you told us that you haven't opened the frame store. I can't. I mean, that isn't an option at this point. When you said you're hanging uh, plastic, you, that's what you're talking about. Plan, that's your plan. That's what you're going to do when you can open. We're going to do it for sure when we open again. And then on top of which, I am putting in some software where you can frame online and come pick it up. I don't think that my customers mostly are going to decide after all these years that they're going to want to start framing pictures online. I don't believe, I I believe that most people are going to get back to quote unquote, some kind of normal. And I think that, um, I do, I don't think that, that the world's going to stop doing picture framing. That's what I'm counting on. Mm -hmm. and, And just so you have some perspective, I'm dealing with a very small niche market, people who are into their interiors, people that want to frame their, their own photographs are, most people have never been into a frame shop and never will. So I'm dealing with a very small niche. With that being said, they're into it because they realize the secret to a happy life is having beautiful picture framing. And they know that. So they're not going to stop. <laughs> and I thought it was meditation and no, no, enlightenment. That's, it's a little known fact that it's picture oh, framing first shit. and then meditation. And then. Oh, God, stuff. I've been way off track. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help. <laughs> Jay, could you open the, the the frame shop on by appointment only? Technically, yeah. Uh, no, mm-hmm. I mean, could I get away with it um, and lock the door? And, probably, but then I got the problem with now I got to bring people into production to go do the framing, and and believe me, I thought about it, but like. I don't know that it's worth all the trouble because unlike a restaurant, you know, you lose the meal in the restaurant, it's gone. Here's a case of if they have a picture to frame, they'll wait for me to open. So there'll be some pent up demand. I don't know that it's going to be worth all of the trouble to try to do that. But I'm wondering with the amount of time that people are spending at home, they may need to do things around the house like picture framing. Yeah. Like we're getting a new roof put on our, our garage, right? So there are things that we're now doing around the house because we're here all the time. And I think that's a marketing push if you want to invest the dollars in saying, are you tired of looking at that old da 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 Have it framed at the, this, Here's this the problem, job. though. Yeah. The problem is, the question is, how many of my customers have been financially affected by this, whether psychologically because their stock portfolio is down or because they were laid off? I don't know. I mean, that's the problem. For but I think money. your niche market you are a niche market, right? You're not a hamburger, right. right? You're a Costco. You're not a Sam's. No offense to those to those two big major businesses. I think your niche market is spending money. Lowe's is jammed for a reason. People are at home getting paid. And I think I think if you market it to people who are, you know, working from home, still making their salary, um, because business is still coming in. I think, you know, hey, you know, this wall doesn't have to be drab anymore. And this is how we can help you make your home beautiful while you're in it. Why don't you I just market there's... to Karen's, all of Karen's employees? Right. I was going to say, market to Karen's <laughs> employees, right? And I'm wondering if you could expand your market, right? Oh. I see you shipping across the country. I know there are women that are cross-stitching right now. There's a company that... that... Uh, went into doing online framing. They've gone through $90 million and still don't make any money. And custom picture framing is still one of those things 
mm. that you're better off doing it in person to see the texture, to see the stuff. And then on top of which, shipping glass is not a great thing. No, and exactly. then if you've got any artwork that's of any value and the, the art is hinged properly, meaning it's suspended in the frame, by mm. definition, it can't be shipped upside down. It'll break the hinges. So it's just, it's, it's the lot. worst possible yeah. thing to try to ship. And it's flat and the UPS charges get more because it's flat and it's bigger. It's heavy. Than what I've learned about business is I can't say six steps ahead. I'm taking one step at a time and we'll see what comes because I, I, you know, I, I see people on the news now with their predictions of this is going to be the, dep this is going to be a depression with the world war two. And it's like, shut up. I mean, you just don't know anything. I mean, you don't know that. And, and they're making predictions. There's absolutely no way of, yeah, you've been saying that week after week here and, and it's gotten pretty bad. You've noticed that, right? <laughs> it is bad. It's horrible. How about CNN saying, Unemployment numbers, there's people have lost their jobs. Um, we're the same jobless as the depression. Okay, did they remember the fact that people can't go to work right now and that as soon as their businesses are open up, they're going back to work? To use to use the unemployment number and to say they lost their jobs. They didn't lose their jobs. They were furloughed for a month or two, but they never make that distinction. Jay, they 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 don't have their jobs. They've been furloughed. They didn't lose their job. They were furloughed. There's no guarantee that those jobs will be there for them two months from now. Uh, for most of them, it will. Maybe. You don't know that. Make a parallel between this point in time. All right. Let's not argue economics. I I, I want to I can, I can find another way to annoy you again. You're very good at it. You're actually gifted. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I want to go back to what you said about... Uh, about the concerns among your employees. And, and I think it's an important point. And, and let, let me stress here, uh, you know, you, you've been kind enough to share your journey on this podcast. And, and I do appreciate that. And I'm asking you these questions because you're here, a representative of, you know, all three of you are representative of people who are trying to make the best of a really awful situation. So I want to stress that I, you know, when I ask about the, the, you know, what the experts are saying and the risks. It's not because I think that whether or not there's a second wave hinges upon whether Jason home is open or not, but it's, it, you, you know, it, it's, you're representative of a lot of businesses that have to make really difficult decisions. And, and I want to try to think those through. Part of it involves your employees. You mentioned that your uh, employees aren't terribly happy about this. And I think that brings up an important point because you can be incredibly responsible in the store. And I'm sure you are. Um, but your employees have to get there. And some may be taking public transportation. Some may be pumping gas. There are things they have to do that increases the risk. And it, you know, it changes the, the risk factor for all of us. So I, I'm asking, how are you dealing with the concerns among your employees? If somebody said, I don't want to take the L, blah, 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 I would get someone to pick them up. My HR person's calling every single employee to make sure they're okay. And it turns out one guy who didn't speak great English, did not file for unemployment soon enough. He literally, he put his wife on the phone because his English wasn't great. And he, he's been with me for four years. And she said, we have no money. We need medication for our kid. I went over there and gave him some cash to get him through it. They'll get, they'll eventually get unemployment. So we are doing what we can. And, and, and for the employees, I wouldn't tell someone to go take the L at this point, if that's a problem. Um, it's just not black and white. What about somebody who has, who's been caring for, for somebody or has or you know, or has kids at home who can't go to school yeah they should stay home i mean what am i gonna do they should stay home but did, does that create a problem in terms of unemployment if they're um if you are asking them to come back i'm gonna guess not um not my call it's unemployment's call it, i'm i i'm gonna guess not but i you know i'm not gonna tell everybody lock your kids in the closet come to work i need you here i mean <laughs> Um, though some of them would be happy to do that at this point, I can assure you. Um, I have one person who comes to work every day. She's got a nanny at home and she doesn't want to be at home and she hasn't missed a day and she's happy to be at work. I mean, there are people that want to go to work every day. Um, will there be some collateral damage on this at the end? Is there somebody that's going to um, maybe I mean, maybe there is going to come a point where where people need to go back to work and we're going to have to say to them. It's not going to be this month, probably. It'll probably be after the whole stay is lifted and things are supposed to be getting back tomorrow. At some point, we would have to tell the person, listen, we need someone to take care of the customers when they come in. And if you don't want to come in, 
we're going to have to replace your job. I mean, what am I going to do? Wait. What if they say, I really like to wait till the end of the year when winter comes in it. I I mean, there's some point where you got to take care of business. And, and believe me, these people that are out there protesting, I'm not supporting that at all, but there is a line somewhere. You will never be risk-free in this situation. It's not, not for a year or two. There is going to be a point that some people are still going to have it. And somebody's going to have to say, okay, it's safe enough. You know, I live in a city of 250,000 people and you walk around and you would almost never even know that this is happening. You know, I mean, we've had, I don't know, 100 cases in the whole county, 200 cases in the whole county. I think we've all had different experiences based on either a geography or what kind of business we're in. Um, And I, I just don't think the rules are going to apply the same to everybody. No, I can you tell know? you, if you walk out front here, people jogging, walking their door, most people have masks on. It's it's all mm-hmm. over the place. I went to Home Depot uh, a week ago and people were, the, some of the employees didn't have masks and I had a mask on. I walked up to, to one of the people and I go, is there a store manager? Yeah, Al, is he here? No, he's off today. I go, why aren't you wearing a mask? Well, I had it on before. I go, you should have it on all the time. I went in there this morning. There wasn't a person in the store without a mask. So it's, and they did make it a law as of today. So I go to the grocery store. I'm one of three people in the grocery store. Never even cross somebody in the aisle. I see one person the whole time. There's plexiglass Mm -hmm. in between me and the lady that checks us out. So I'm, all I'm saying is that, and we all know this and we've heard this, but based on where we live and the population density and probably other factors, um, we're having completely different experiences, Mm -hmm. very, very different experiences. So Lauren, when it comes to, can you open business? Is that the responsible thing to do? Blah, blah, blah. Yes. Or overall, no, it is not the right thing to do. But I think that in some cases, you know, if we use good judgment, that it's not necessarily a bad thing. I want to follow up on that. But Jay, this is uh, would be a good time for you to go find out uh, what your uh, traffic has been like. OK, you talk about me while I'm gone. Oh, I'll be gone trust for us. 40 we will. seconds. <laughs> I'll listen to the recording later. Hold on. Laura, let me ask you, um, y- you shut down your brick and mortar store, I believe. Um what what where do things stand with that is there any prospect of it reopening no no we don't have any plans to reopen it not for quite a while is that because the restrictions remain in place or because you don't feel the need to reopen it um i think a little bit of both uh part of it is even is our customer base is an elder i mean not elderly um but <laughs> you know some of our customer base is a high risk base so i don't feel like it's necessarily the, I don't feel any urgency, um, given that we have other sources of income. Um, and that's not the primary part of our business. It's not the primary driver. And you've been selling well online. You've told us, uh, after waking that that's still true. Yeah. The retail store has always been 5% or less of our business. So, um, yeah, no, I don't feel any urgency. Um, and even, you know, our store manager is an older man uh, in his 60s and he's taken off, you know, and he's on unemployment right now and just decided he left a long time ago. He's like, it's not worth it. It's not worth the risk. So mm. once we hit the 14 days or maybe 21 days of of no more cases in town, um, we'll consider it. But I'm not in a rush. The company you bought in Texas is a wholesaler that sells to uh, retail yarn shops around the country. And you've told us that that's struggled for obvious reasons throughout this. Is there any indication that some of those stores uh, are starting to open? Uh, How's that looking? It's consistent. So we're losing money every day. Um, You know, I told you we're paying people even if they're not coming to work uh, because we don't have enough work for them. Um, but at least we're losing money consistently. So we're able to kind of predict it. And we don't see that changing significantly for probably three months. We're also, um, you know, our suppliers, we have a mill in Peru and a mill in South Africa. I mean, they've been shut down and they're going to be, and they're the primary suppliers of yarn of wool in the world. Um, and so even the other yarn suppliers in the country, none of us can get our yarn. So we're all going to kind of run out of product here in just a little bit. How soon? Um, we're thinking we have about six weeks of supply left, um, at the current demand, given that our demand is about half of what it 
normally would be. Is there anything you can do? What Do you have a plan? Yes. We have some some older inventory that has been sitting around that we inherited, um, or I guess we purchased. So we'll just get creative with old inventory. We're going to get creative. We have a lot of kind of mistakes, some second quality or some items that people had canceled. So stuff that's in the returns pile. How big um, an industry is the iron business? You know, at one point it was about, it was like 1.1 billion. That's interesting because yeah. framing's about two and a half. So then I would argue probably only 1% of the population is knitting stuff. That's it couldn't be much more to, to only do a billion dollars in the United States. So you're also yeah. dealing with a tiny little niche. Oh, it's tiny. Yeah, very, very tiny. Okay, so I'm back. Ten customers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which, you know, not bad. How much did they spend? I don't know. I didn't spend there long enough to find out. Ten customers just for plants? Yeah, there's not that many plants. I just, I got to tell you, I got here at eight this morning. There wasn't a plant in the lot. So I was, con- the truck just came. It's probably only a quarter filled. We're waiting for more shipments to come in throughout the day and then through Monday. So, and it's not that hot out. It's like, you know, it when the temperature goes up, people like all of a sudden, like, you know, get activated and go out to plant their gardens. Right now it's probably in the 50s, so it's still a little chilly. But I think tomorrow I'm expecting, I would think by tomorrow we'll probably be doing okay out there. Um, I'm curious, and I know this is a tangent, but why would somebody buy a plant from you as opposed to Home Depot or Lowe's? Um, Because, um, you know, I got into the business like by accident. I'm not, I'm not in anything close. To, I, I have no idea about that stuff. I'm a picture frame guy, but the building came up for sale and I was trying to tie up the real estate for something and I, I wasn't ready to move framing. So I feel as a placeholder, I opened a garden store and what we learned over the first couple of years, we're in an upscale urban environment. We're not Home Depot. They don't come in with dirty blue jeans and a laundry list of what they want. They want cool, interesting stuff. So just like in my frame business, just like in the home store, it's a boutique thing. We carry okay. the coolest, nicest, best plants we can find. We don't have everything. I can't even give you the names because I don't know it. We don't carry it. We carry whatever the best in the market is at the moment. And people appreciate that. And they come here because Home Depot is literally one mile away, if not maybe even less. So, Laura, how, how much is Jay paying you to ask questions like that? Oh, no, I think it's a really good. I mean, it's it a good a one good for question. us to think about is like, why yes. would you go there? I agree. And what? What differentiates? It's yeah. the same thing in the yarn industry. Like, why would you come to Jimmy Beans and buy yarn when you could go to Joann's or Michael's? Well, you know, there's a quality Laura, thing. There's a service. Laura, he doesn't understand the higher level stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he no, does. That was He's a really good close question. to Princeton. No, that was a smart yeah. question. Believe me, I asked myself that. And the other thing is Home Depot, they buy stuff from vendors. They don't actually pay for it till it gets bought by the customer. So the stuff's not taken care of that well. We have people that are paying more attention to the plants and yeah. um, they, you know, they want better Do you better play the music at night? Do you play we the plants music? Kinds. Yeah, it's a whole it's a whole lifestyle business thing, yeah. Okay, great. I <laughs> just want to make sure those plants are taken care of. You're nurtured. Everything we do is nurtured. Aww. <laughs> All right. Before I offend all three of you. It's too late for that. (laughs) We're going to have to wrap this up. Um, Thank you all for doing this. Uh, I appreciate, again, as always, the fact that you're willing to come here and be so transparent about what you're going through. I think it means a lot to a lot of people. I would just say to people who don't own businesses, it's really easy to sit back and take shots at business owners like, oh, I would never open. You know what? Have you ever had to pay the rent on Friday? I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's, it is a little frustrating to see the politicians who have never run a lemonade stand deciding the way businesses should be running. What I'm learning through this whole process is you, you have to do what you have to do. I yeah. know I've, I've applied for over 14 grants two loans. I got my EIDL today, which is wonderful. I've got the PPP. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we buried the lead. I, I should have asked you about that at the beginning. I don't know anybody who's gotten an EIDL. Me neither. So I, got I don't even know what that is. Yeah. So it's the emergency disaster loan. It's the SBA's disaster loan and it's been all messed up. That's why I'm getting ready for the second wave and using grant money to keep the lights on, keep the phones on, keep the internet going, getting ready for when we hit go, ordering new capes. Because when we get the new capes, it's a matter of that cape is done for the day. No more disinfecting it and using it again. In this climate, since 
you know, the people, my market is being disproportionately affected. African Americans are being disproportionately affected. So since that's majority of my business, I have to do what I have to do as a business owner to keep the guests of Paralee Boyd safe. So no, you know, towels are always thrown out, but tripling up on towels, tripling up on capes, and just getting ready to go and using the money that I'd be fortunate enough to get through grants and EIDL and PPP to hold the ship together. For those that have listened to this podcast from the beginning, you've gotten to watch how Dana has gone from a warrior <laughs> to a warrior. Totally. And you have your own superwoman cape. And I couldn't be prouder and happier to be associated with you because you are yeah. Entrepreneur of the Year. Thank you. <laughs> On that note, my thanks to Jay Goltz, Dana White, and Laura Zander. Really appreciate it, guys. Be careful out there. Thanks for listening, everybody. This episode was produced by Jess Thubaran, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, we started the 21 Hats podcast to help business owners feel a little less isolated, to let them know they aren't the only ones fighting these battles. If you got something out of this conversation, please help us reach more people. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats. And let me know if you have a question or a comment or a topic you'd like us to cover. My email address is lfeldman at 21hats.com. See you next time.